previous videos, we've looked at parts 5 and 6 of the TOEIC reading section. In this video, we look at the final part, part 7, reading comprehension. Now, on the reading comprehension tests, there are sections referred to as single passages in which you have to read only one piece of text, and then there are other there's another section referring to double passages in which there are two pieces of text. Now, we will look at each one of these uh, a little more carefully a little bit later in the video. But first, we're going to look at the general strategy and ideas behind Part 7. The reading comprehension section of this part of the test requires an understanding of several things. The business area that's being represented in the reading. The format of the reading passage itself. For example, is it a letter, a memo, etc.? the main ideas or what we might also refer to as the purpose or intention of the text how details and facts work to support ideas how vocabulary works in context and making inferences and predictions now for the next couple of minutes we're going to look at each one of these in just kind of a general way so first we're going to start off with looking at the business area now, for the business area, it's important to think about what are the basic assumptions and characteristics of each area of business that's being represented on the test. For example, if you were to see a memo written to in hotel employees, you might notice that it ha it'll have some structural similarities to a memo sent to, uh, let's say, corporate executives at a bank. But the content of, that, of these two memos would be different. And part of that is because this is relating to what we might call the audience of the reading. So uh, on the test, you might see some questions that actually kind of think about, well, who exactly is going to need to read this information? Who might be interested? So as we said before, thinking about the difference between what hotel employees need to see compared to the executives who run the bank. So even though they might both be uh, communicated to in a memo, their content, the information included, would be different. So again, this might uh, these types of questions often ask us to think about who needs to read it uh, and the purpose for reading and, and their particular purpose for reading it. Next, we're going to look at the format. Now again, when we refer to the format, we are talking about the actual way that the information is being conveyed. So for example, comparing a memo to the hotel employees compared to a letter and in this case a hotel a letter maybe to hotel guests so for example a memo would probably give s sort of different information uh, for example since memos are things that we usually give to employees or people that we d that directly work under um, supervisors and so on a memo might contain some information as to um, some complaints that customers have had that need to be addressed a letter on the other hand generally tends to be more formal and is usually sent to people outside of a particular company. So for example, uh, a, a customer may have given a complaint about the hotel and that letter itself might be the, the complaint that the person has written. So again, don't be surprised to see questions. Even though they won't directly ask you about the format, the questions themselves will definitely reflect the type of information that's being given. And of course, we can often think about why the format might uh, help us in this, in this idea. Next, let's look at the main ideas or the purpose. Now, when we skim the text at the beginning, you'll probably no it'll probably notice that we can pick out the sort of main ideas of the passage. And generally, I tell students there are three to five main ideas in a reading passage itself. So when you see questions involving main ideas, uh, and these that generally ask about the intention or purpose of the entire passage. So again, you might see a particular question that say, what's the purpose of this reading? Well, oftentimes you won't be able to tell just right away. You may have to look through all of the information first before you start getting an idea as to why this information is being written. For example, why would the CEO of a company be writing a particular letter to its shareholders? the company shareholders. So again, we have to kind of look through and say, well, you know what, there may not just be one simple idea. We may have to kind of combine information uh, in order for us to kind of come up with a, uh, an overall idea as to why the letter would be sent. 
And really, you can do this only by looking through the whole text. So in this case, when we see a main idea or purpose question, uh, we may have to really take a moment and look through all of the text just to get a basic idea of what's being said. Now, sometimes maybe it's easy for us to figure out, but keep in mind it may not be. Now the question, of course, is where can we find some of this uh, important information? Where do we typically see in main ideas in a reading? Well, oftentimes we forget to pay attention to the, the little parts, for example, like the title of the passage, or let's say if you have a memo, this might be uh, referring to the regarding line in a memo. We could also find this kind of information at the beginning or ending of paragraphs, especially for reading more narrative text. And again, we might refer to those first sentences of each paragraph as a topic sentence. Of course, we can also find important information near what we call signal words. And this brings us to our first TOEIC hint. Signal words themselves are very important in reading. They involve a broad variety of words that help signal or indicate what you're about to read or how that information connects to information before or after it. Now signal words can work on many levels. They can work between sentences to link sentences together. They can work inside of sentences to connect information together. They may even help connect paragraphs to each other. Now, signal words, again, come in many different categories. This is just only a small sample of the different types of words that you probably need to pay attention to on the test. For example, words that convey a sequence, things such as first or next or then. Words that indicate uh, that an illustration or example is coming up. Words such as for example or such as. Signals that indicate a definition is coming, such as this is called or this is known as. Signals that give a cause or effect, something that's as a result or in effect. Finally, words that give compare or contrasting information. So for example, if we're contrasting, we might say something like on the contrary or on the other hand. You'll find a more complete list at the link listed below. And again, there are more categories than just these few. Now again, we talked about signal words. Uh, obviously, they're important and we need to learn them. We can also kind of recognize that signal words come in specific places. For example, at the beginning of sentences, often followed by a comma. So in this case, first, comma, the doctor wanted. So again, the word first would be an important signal. This would tell us that this is the beginning, perhaps, of a list. Maybe in the middle of sentences, often separated by a comma or even a semicolon. He said, comma, but, she thought. Again, but would be considered a signal. He said, semicolon, however, she thought. So again, notice these two pieces of information are actually not the same. Many students think that but and however are basically the same word, but really they're not. So in this case, probably the two sentences where these are being found are probably giving slightly different information. We can also find signal words at the beginning or end of paragraphs. So signal words can often tell us where the important ideas are going to be. Uh, we will also see that they'll play a part when it comes to finding detailed information as well. Now, moving on to details and facts. When we refer to details and facts, oftentimes this means a question that will require us to scan for information in the passage. And again, scanning generally means looking for specific ideas. Now, one trick we can probably notice, uh, and we'll see in the examples in just a moment, is that oftentimes the information that we're looking for may not be worded exactly the same way as is included in the passage. On the other hand, details or facts generally tend to be about uh, important pieces of information in the passage. So they're probably not going to ask a question or a detail or fact about something that's not you know, very important or relevant. Generally, the detail questions involve something to do with the main idea of the overall passage. Looking at vocabulary... Vocabulary in context usually involves understanding how words work in a particular reading. 
So the questions themselves uh, are not necessarily business specific. So you're not necessarily going to see a lot of specific business terminology. Uh, but on the other hand, you may not often find words that will just give you the first definition. Sometimes you may be looking at the second or third definition of a word. Well, for example, a phrase such as the chair of the department. Now, uh, we're going to leave the presentation just for a moment and go to dictionary.com. If you notice here in this example, we'll uh, zoom in a little bit, that the first definition of the word chair, and again chair as a noun, is of course referring to the piece of furniture. Number two is referring to something that might look like a chair or serve as a chair. So for example, if someone is carrying an injured person, they might put their hands together to make a place for someone to sit. It's only really when you get to 3, 4, and 5 do you notice that we're talking about something that's not furniture related or serving as furniture, but actually talking about a, a position. And in this case, a position of authority or a person at a particular office, a seat of office, like, for example, the chairperson of a meeting, someone who's running a particular uh, meeting. So in this case, with the vocabulary questions, don't be surprised if they're asking about a particular word that maybe you're not quite sure what it means um, in this context. Maybe you know uh, one definition of the word, or perhaps two, but it may not be the definition that they're looking for. Finally, in looking at making an inference or a prediction, basically the idea is that making an inference refers to how to draw a logical conclusion using the information we're given in the text. So these are questions that kind of ask things such as what will likely happen or possibly happen. So that's the thing to think about on the TOEIC. When we see a piece of information, we have to think what will be the result of a particular action or what is suggested by the passage. For example, if you see an announcement that mentions that all sales are final, which often happens on customer receipts, then a logical conclusion would be that people could not bring the item back for a refund. Now that seems fairly logical to us now, but notice again, it may not tell us directly that we cannot bring the item back for a refund. It may tell us only that the sales are final. So in this case, this is something we would have to logically conclude or to infer. And again, even though the TOEIC does not include a lot of inference questions, we do have to be prepared to draw a conclusion from the information that's given. So, let's review what we've done so far. As we said, the reading comprehension section will ask questions about a variety of things. The business area or audience that's uh, in question. The format of the reading passage. The main ideas or purpose of the text. How details and facts work to support ideas. How vocabulary works in context. And finally, making inferences and predictions. So, as we're getting ready to jump into the questions and the readings themselves, one thing students often want to know is, do we really need to read that much, or can't we just go to the questions themselves and use the questions to help us find the answers? Well, I often tell my students that when it comes to tests in general, the purpose of the questions on the test are actually for you to answer the questions. But believe it or not, sometimes the questions can help us understand what we're reading better. So part of the idea here really depends on, uh, I think, the, the length of the passage itself. So again, sometimes students are looking for a shortcut, so they wonder, well, can I just look at the questions and go find the information? And that it might be possible, especially in the single passages, that, that may be short enough so that you could go to the questions and probably find the answers fairly quickly. But keep in mind, not all of the single passages are short. Some of the single passages are a little bit longer, and in fact, when you see the double passages, which have you know two readings, uh, it may take longer and more time. And of course, you may have more questions as well to answer. So in these cases, it might be more difficult to go to the questions first. So in looking at two different approaches with single passage, if it's a shorter passage, it probably would be okay to look at the questions or the prompts first use those questions to determine how to go back and maybe read a little more carefully in order to find that answer. You can scan for the answers in the text and remember one thing we're going to uh, reiterate throughout the video is that the questions are usually in sequence. 
and then you could use the process of elimination to you know remove wrong answer choices but as we mentioned with the longer passages it's probably going to be a good idea to at least skim the text first just to get an overall idea of the passage and to locate ideas then you can use the questions to determine how to go back and read the information more carefully you can scan for the answers in the text and again remember the questions are usually in sequence and then you can begin using the process of elimination. So to get back to our question, really the idea here is to think about how to use your time efficiently. So what I often tell students is that trying to read everything at the beginning anyway would probably take too much time. In this case, the more familiar you are with the content and form of the passage, it probably will be easier to answer certain questions. So, for example, if you see uh, an advertisement or a very short email, those are probably going to be more familiar to you as the, as the reader. But, you know, you need to pay attention to certain things that might give you information in a quick way. So, for example, the title and the format really will, I think, help uh, in getting you to be more efficient on the test. And then, of course, keep in mind some questions may take more time. For example, detail and inference questions will probably require a more careful reading or oftentimes going back and scanning for information. So keep in mind those types of questions may take more time and require more careful uses of the process of elimination. Now the longer passages, including those double passages, uh, keep in mind you will see more questions. So that will also give you an idea depending on how much time you should spend in engaging with the passage. So as you will notice in just a minute, oftentimes uh, the reading passage itself may not have that many questions. So it's not necessary for you to read everything. But the longer the passage is, oftentimes you will see more questions. All right, we're just about ready to see our first reading. But let's think about for a moment uh, how these readings are organized and, and give us a chance to kind of think like the test makers. So let's try a pre-reading activity. Let's imagine that we work for an art gallery and that we need to write a newspaper announcement of a public sale of various art items. Now think about just for a moment, what would this announcement look like? Part of the idea is to think about certain things that we would need to put in the advertisement. Think about the important information that we need to give. And, of course, think about what would the actual format look like. If this were going to be an advertisement, now, of course, uh, we might want to think about including photos, perhaps, especially if this is going to be a large advertisement. But we need to think about, you know, what kind of order would we put the information? What would go first? What would go next? What do we generally put at the bottom of an announcement? Finally, if we're going to capture someone's attention, we often need to think about, well, who would be the audience? And, of course, maybe what part of the newspaper will be put this advertisement in. Now that we've started to think about some of these things, let's go ahead now and actually look at some sample questions from the test. Now, you probably have realized at this point that the single passage we're going to look at first is... Exactly, an advertisement for an art gallery. Now, before we look at the questions, let's go for a moment and look at the actual... Uh, advertisement itself. Now let's pull out our pen feature here and see if we can pick up some of the things we were trying to think about. First off, notice the organization and the format of the of the reading itself. At the beginning we have this sort of um, attention getter, attention art enthusiasts. So already we kind of know who needs to be reading this particular passage. Well, people who like art. Next we have an indication as to where and what exactly is going on. It's a sale at a particular gallery. Now, even if I don't read anything else in this particular passage, I can already pretty much guess what the rest of this uh, text includes. If it's a public sale from an art gallery, and again, I know it's an art gallery because right at the beginning I see that art is part of the discussion, and I know that's usually what galleries do, is display art. This is probably going to be an art sale of different kinds of paintings, perhaps, sculptures, who knows. So again, notice I don't necessarily have to memorize all of the information that I see here. I just have to kind of notice some things. Here's the address. So we can kind of just put a little shorthand there. There's the address. Uh, here are the typical th the items that are going to be sold. So again, I only have to kind of notice those at the moment. Uh, this information here is the date and time. 
So again, how could that be helpful to us? Well, maybe there's a question involved, maybe not. And then at the bottom, I do see that w there is a website involved. And again, usually, since we're you know used to buying things on the Internet, more than likely we can find pictures, descriptions of these items online. So again, notice I don't necessarily have to remember all the information right now. I only have to pay attention as to where it's organ uh, where does it located. And again, I think most of us can agree that this seems to be a fairly logical way to organize an art advertisement, uh, an art sale. Okay, now let's jump into the questions. And let's kind of look at the questions for a moment to start thinking about some things. So, for example, as I look at the question types themselves, it's probably a good idea to start thinking about what kinds of questions they are. What are they asking for? And I can start to notice in the, in the key, uh, the prompts themselves, some key words. For example, in 153, I notice the word purpose. In 154, I do notice the words people and online. So, Immediately, when I look at the prompt itself, I can begin to start to identify what kinds of things they're looking for. So think about what types of questions are these? What are they asking for? Well, uh, we're going to pull up our little chart here and kind of think about some of the things we discussed in the earlier part of the video. So look at our chart on the right side here. Can we match the idea to the question prompt? So in 153, what is the purpose? Well, that again requires us to look at all of the notice. So in this case, it seems to connect very well to our first question type here on the list. It's a main purpose, a main idea or purpose question. Okay, now what about 154? Well, in the language at the beginning, it says according to the notice, which means already I need to look through the notice. What can people do online? So that word what probably tells us it's we're looking for some specific piece of information. So instead, this is not a question about the purpose of the whole advertisement. This is actually looking for a specific piece of information, a detail in this case. Now we think about where in the text can we find this information? Well, it really is going to depend on the language in the prompt itself. So this gets us to think a little bit about our first TOEIC trick, and that is the idea of synonyms. Now, synonyms basically is referring to how we, how we can restate information using similar words. And this is something that TOEIC really loves to do, because it makes it a little more difficult to find the answer. So just for a moment, we're going to go back and look at question 154 again. Now, if you notice, as I look at the prompt, I do see those words online. But when I go back to the text, I don't see the words online anywhere. Instead, what I have to do is to be able to identify that online and website, which is listed here at the bottom, basically mean the same thing. Now, at this point, maybe you're pretty pretty much familiar with that. So maybe 154 is not a very difficult question. But again, it helps us to illustrate how the TOEIC is trying to trick us. It's not going to use words that are exactly the same. It's going to involve finding words that basically have the same meaning. So keep in mind, the answer choices we're often looking for, they often do not have the exact same wording. This is a trick. So now let's try to see if we can figure out how to solve the, the answers themselves. And remember, be careful. In the answer choices, there may be uh, some particular words that might trick us. For example, in 153, in thinking about the purpose, let's go through and use the process of elimination to decide which ones to keep and which ones to eliminate. So let's start with A, to announce a sale of artwork. Okay, well, I do see the word sale. So that's the same word. But I don't necessarily see the word artwork. So I have to think about, is artwork perhaps the same as art itself? I see the word pieces, oils, watercolors, tapestries. These seem to be examples of artwork. So for now, let's keep this one. We'll put a question mark. And B, to advertise the opening of a hotel. 
Well, again, I do see the word hotel and hotel here. So it's perhaps going to be the opening of a hotel. But again, why would you mention the word art in the ad? So in this case, B seems to be one we could probably fairly easily eliminate. Now C looks a little trickier. I do see the word painting, which of course does kind of relate to some of the ideas of paintings that I see. And of course, painting is a type of art. But I don't see anything about an actual lesson or anything similar to it. I do notice that sale often has the same idea as discount, but in this case, that is not the same idea. If something is on sale versus it is a sale, uh, now we're confusing us with a particular word that is playing on a different meaning of the word. So in this case, we're going to eliminate. As we said before, be careful. Synonyms may be similar in meaning, but they may not necessarily make sense in this situation. Finally, to publicize the photography exhibition, now that looks, again, like a possibility. Maybe this is going to be an exhibition of certain things. But notice photography, pictures or whatever, are, again, not necessarily included at the beginning. Perhaps one idea of a trick could be here at the bottom. But, again, I think we pretty much know that if we know what oils and watercolors are, that's not necessarily the main purpose of advertising for a photography exhibition. So in this case, I think our answer would have to be A. It's the only one that makes sense. Now, how do I know that this is the answer uh, based on the question? Well, remember, the purpose questions oftentimes require us to skim all of the information. But I think we can probably see that it didn't take very long if I just go back and look at the beginning of the advertisement. I could probably pretty much guess without having to go too much further. So notice one thing we talked about earlier is that often questions do come in sequence. So I want us to think about that as we look here. Notice how that first question can be answered somewhere near the beginning. So even though it is a particular purpose question, uh, this particular ad is fairly easy to look at very quickly. Now the second question we've just talked about was the fact that notice how 154 is asking about a question that's closer to the end of the text. And again, that was the trick that we saw with the idea of online versus the website. Now these are the only two questions for this reading. So in a sense, notice the sequence is that 153 is somewhere at the beginning and 154 is going to be somewhere after it. It's not always true that the, one, that the first question will be at the very beginning and that the second question will be at the very end, but it is true that 153, in terms of what it's looking for, it can be answered in a way before you probably need to answer 154. So in 154, how can we answer the question? Well, now that we know where to, where to look, we're looking now at this part, what exactly can we do online? Can we purchase anything? Well, again, I don't see that we can purchase things, even though I do see the word select. Select, in this case, is actually describing the word items. And it looks like we basically can see descriptions and pictures, but I don't think that we can actually buy anything online. Again, this is a public sale. That's what it says here at the beginning. Can we order tickets? Well, that seems like a logical thing to do online. But again, I don't see any information about how to pay or how much it would cost to buy tickets to this event. And of course, it says it's a public sale. So in this case, we could probably eliminate that one as well. Register for art classes? Well, again, online would seem to me that we could probably register something. Of course, that was true for A, B, and C. We often do purchase things online or order things online or register things online. But once again, we do not see a description of art classes. We do know that it has something to do with art, but in this case, not about instruction. So probably D is going to be our answer, but let's take a look at it anyway. Well, notice again here how synonyms can often help us. View is very similar to the idea of description. We can view these items online. We can see them. So in this case, it seems pretty apparent that D would be the answer. So notice how synonyms oftentimes can trick us, but synonyms often can reveal the answer. Whereas in other situations, words that seem to appear in the text may actually trick us as well. Art and art here. 
And of course I see select and I see select here. So again, if you notice, these are things that can trick students if you're not paying much attention. Now let's move on to the double passages and questions. Now first off, let's kind of compare the two. The double passage section involves much of the same strategy, but there is one key difference. Since there are two passages, we have to think about how these two are somehow directly related to each other. So think about how the first passage, how might it mention and relate to the second one? So as we look at this example, we're going to actually think about some things that we're going to try to guess even before we skim or read or do anything with the, uh, the body of the text itself. So look at these two pieces of information and notice right away what are some things we can guess. Well, first off, the easiest thing to see is the format. So what are the formats of these two readings? Well, on the left side, it does appear to be a letter. And as I scan and skim, skim through the information in the second passage, I have to look a little bit more carefully to see. It appears to be something from a cafe. And I see the word certificate. And I do see a, a, an amount. And again, remember, the TOEIC is an international test. So in this case, this is the symbol for a pound, which is the currency in England. So this particular amount off of a particular price. So this appears to be either some sort of coupon or maybe gift card. Now, let's have to th we have to really think to ourselves, what could possibly be the connection between these two pieces of information? Well, for example, is it possible that the gift card uh, was contained in a letter that was being sent or mailed to somebody? That's a possibility. Could the letter be a request for a gift card? or a coupon. That's a possibility as well. Of course it's going to really require us to look through all of the information but notice how again we're starting to think how are these two things related. That's something we need to think about because again we have to ask ourselves why are there two pieces of information. Clearly the TOEIC would want you to think about that relationship. So on the double passages we do have to do a little more work. First off, we think about those formats and how they could be related. Next, we're actually going to have to take a moment and skim through them. If we can skim through them, we probably can either confirm or change our particular guess about how these two things are related or connected. Next, when we look at the questions, we need to think about what types of questions are being asked. As we said before, the questions are usually going to be in sequence and then we use the process of elimination. So let's look at the questions. Here's question 181. Why did Simon Jenkins write the Gene Sokol? Well already we've got something to start looking for. Who are these people? And why did this person write to this person? And 182 in the letter, the word reservation in paragraph 1, line 5, is closest in meaning. So here we're looking at the actual definition of a word. So these are some things we can already start to look for. And of course, notice how the TOEIC is trying to help you, at least, by you know, giving you, uh, in 182, for example, where exactly to find that word. Now, looking at our question types, we start to think, well, what types of questions are these? Well, 181 asks the question why, which would seem to relate to the actual entire purpose of the uh, information. So the question is, why did this person write this? So thinking about the letter, why was the letter written by this person to Gene Sokol? Question 182 is fairly easy to identify because it's asking about vocabulary. But notice it's asking about the idea of the word in the context. So we'll come back to this in just a moment. Now let's look at the remaining three questions. What is suggested about Gene Sokol? 184, what is Simon Jenkins offering? And 185, where does Simon Jenkins most likely work? Again, looking at our question types, just to try to guess, part of the idea is to think about those key words again. Suggested. 184, what is someone offering? 
and 185, where does Simon Jenkins, but notice this word here, most likely work. So in this case, 183 and 185 are asking us to infer something, something that may not necessarily be directly stated. Whereas 184 is most likely going to be a detail question because it's asking us to look for something specific. What? Of course, it may not be easy to find, but we're not necessarily making a conclusion. It most likely will be in the text that we're looking at. Okay, so now we have the questions on the right side. And then what I've decided to do is just to put the letter first on the left side. Uh, first off, we will probably notice that since this is the first reading passage, we probably need to focus on this one first. And that's most likely because several of the questions do seem to connect to the letter and not the gift card. But we'll think about in a moment what the gift card represents. So, going through each question now, let's try to identify what we're looking for. Well, first off, who are Simon Jenkins and Gene Sokol? Well, Gene Sokol seems to be a person that the letter is being written to. And Simon Jenkins is the person who wrote the letter. And this person is a director of guest relations. Now, a guest relations where? Well, maybe that's something to which the gift card uh, does have a connection to. Well, at this point, let's skim through the information very quickly, picking out some key words. So, Gene Sokol appears to have written a letter concerning a visit to a restaurant. Now, it seems to be because the person, uh, Mr. Jenkins, says that he is sorry that she did not have an enjoyable experience. So, it looks like something happened at the restaurant. So, in this case, as I already see in the first few sentences, we can probably guess that this is a complaint letter, or at least a response to a complaint. Now, look more carefully at the problem. They had to wait over 30 minutes. They had made a reservation. Uh, this is a typical situation where the uh, restaurant or guest direct, uh, director of the guest relations would say that this is an isolated incident and that we usually do a very good job. Uh, this is the promptness of our staff. So in the second paragraph, as I'm skimming through, I see some words, maybe I know, maybe I don't. In an attempt to remedy this unfortunate situation, I'm sending you a complimentary voucher to use at our restaurant. Now, voucher, for those of us who uh, don't speak British English, voucher is probably a word that we would think of as a coupon or a discount. So in this case, that is most likely what the second piece of information is, a voucher that, that this person can use the next time they go to a restaurant. And if you have any other need or assistance, you know, you can contact me. Now, certainly, as you can see, um, you have to have some experience with these types of letters. So oftentimes I tell my students that the TOEIC represents things that we experience in everyday life. Maybe you've never written a complaint letter before, but you probably have some basic idea as to how a complaint letter is organized. So again, notice how the format of the letter also gives us an idea that uh, we probably can expect to see some of that information in the questions. So now we look at 181 again. So why did uh, Simon write to Jean? So was he thanking her for visiting a restaurant? Well, again, maybe. We'll put a question mark. Was he apologizing for poor service? Well, we definitely saw the words, I'm sorry. And we did see uh, the idea that something was unfortunate. So this one definitely seems like a keeper. Is he asking or inquiring about her dining experience? Well, actually, she already discussed her dining experience in the letter she mailed first, that she had to wait for a long time. So in this case, I think we can eliminate C. And then finally, D, is he inviting her to an awards dinner? Well, again, notice the trick here. There is some kind of invitation, but it's not an invitation to a place necessarily uh, or, a, or an event, but actually back to the restaurant to use that voucher. Now, of course, an awards dinner does seem to be a little bit tricky. And, of course, the word dinner itself does seem to be tricky because it's referring to uh, a dinner that the person came and tried to have at the restaurant. But in this case, they're not inviting her to any special ceremony. They're actually just inviting her to come back. So at this point, we've got A and B to choose from. 
And again, as we said before in process of elimination, oftentimes we want to give ourselves at least two choices to kind of eliminate and think about which one is the better answer. Well, in this case, we he probably is thanking her for the information. Uh, I, but notice I don't see the word thanks or, you know, thank you for informing us. It does say here uh, that I agree about something. But I think we pretty much can, can identify at this point that uh, Simon is apologizing. Uh, again, the words I'm sorry would pretty much tell us that something went wrong. And again, remember what we said about the questions in sequence. So again, this information is at kind of the beginning of the reading. Well, so that's where the question is asking. All right, in question 182, since it's a vocabulary question, we actually need to just scan for the word reservation in the text. So let's see if we can change our color here. We're going to reset. So in this case, finding the word reservation, let's use that instead. Uh, we look through the text and we see there's reservation. And again, part of the idea is a concept we referred to in an earlier video, the idea of chunking information. Well, in this case, we make a reservation, and this reservation is in advance. Now, you may already know one or two meanings of the word reservation, and in fact, the meaning you probably know is the one that's being uh, questioned here in the reading. But again, if you notice, some of the choices we're given are acceptable meanings of the word reservation. So, for example, if you, has a, if you have a reservation about something, that could also be considered a hesitation, even close to the idea of a doubt. The problem is both of those make no sense here. We don't make a hesitation, especially connected to a restaurant, and we certainly don't make a doubt. From our other two choices, it does appear that supply also does not seem to make much sense either. And I think at this point we probably can guess the answer is D. Because when we think of reservations in a restaurant, we're making appointments necessary in a way. Again, it's the, I, the question is asking which one is closest in meaning, not necessarily exactly the same. So again, for the voc vocabulary questions, be careful. They may have some of the definitions of the, of the word listed as some of the choices, but it doesn't work in this context. Okay, let's move on to 183. So now thinking about what is suggested, something we kind of have to uh, infer from the letter. Well, in this case, since we scan through the letter itself, let's go through the answer choices and see if we can go ahead and guess. So for example, she has recently traveled to Manchester. Well, uh, that's a possibility, but it says here that the restaurant is in London. So those do not seem to connect. Again, it might be possible, but it doesn't seem to be proven here in this reading. She spoke to Simon Jenkins on the telephone. Again, that might be a possibility, but again, as we notice at the beginning, it says we received a letter. So we probably can eliminate this one as well. She wrote a letter of complaint. Well, that does seem to make sense here because at the beginning it says I have received your letter which would definitely imply that someone wrote a letter to Mr. Jenkins first. So let's keep that one. And then finally, she frequently dines in London. Again, that's a very real possibility. But can we really make that guess from this particular letter? Not really. It might be true, but it's certainly not being addressed by the information in this reading. So again, that's one of the tricky things about looking at inference questions, is that oftentimes we see answer choices that look very possible, but don't make sense in this context. So in this case, I think we can guess that C is the correct answer. Okay, moving on to the next one. So what exactly is Simon offering? Well, again, part of the idea is scanning through the text, and most likely we're not looking at information anymore in the first paragraph, but now we're starting to look at information in the second paragraph. So in this case, what is Simon Jenkins offering? Well, let's go through the choices. Is it a refund? Is it a discount on a future purchase? Are we replacing a damaged product? Or are we offering special assistance in ordering a product? 
Well, right away we can notice that part of the trick is on is playing on the word voucher. Now again, remember the TOEIC is a is an international exam. So some people also might think of vouchers as, you know, something you would do to replace something that's broken or that you would use to buy a particular product online or at a restaurant or at, at a at a business. So in this case, the two that we can eliminate first are C and D. Because we're not talking about a product, we're talking about an actual visit to a restaurant. Now, A and B both seem to be fairly logical uh, responses to a situation such as this. But as we know, that both cannot be correct. Well, as we said before, a complimentary voucher basically means a free voucher. But it doesn't necessarily mean that you get to eat for free. It really does mean a discount. Now we can say that because looking at the, um, if we go back for a moment and look at the actual certificate, as we go back to the certificate, we notice that this particular uh, voucher that we're referring to is a discounted price. So as we see in this case, the voucher is referring to a price off the price of a meal, not a refund for something previous, or, uh, again, money that you would get for a damaged product. Okay, so in this case, we can see that the answer would be the discount. Now, finally, with 185, where does Simon Jenkins most likely work? Now this one's pretty tricky. If we go back here and see here that uh, Jeannie Sokol herself is from Brighton and she's writing to Simon Jenkins who's the director of these guest relations, we can think about is Simon Jenkins in a different location? Well we do see the word, the idea that the restaurant is in London. And since he's the director of guest relations there's a very good chance that London would be the answer. Now, since this is the last question, it probably would be a good idea to go back and actually look at the double passage again and look at the actual gift certificate. Because the gift certificate, since it is the last piece of information to read, we probably need to make sure we look at that before we finish. Because again, with the double passage, we have to understand that there could be a question about any piece of information. Well, first off, we see that the cafe itself uh, has different locations, London, Birmingham, and Manchester. Now again, the letter says London, at least that's where Jeannie went, or Jean. But as we look at the, as we might call the small or fine print, it says, for customer service or inquiries, contact Winchester Falls Guest Relations Department by telephone or by mail at Twickenham Road, Manchester. Now again, the question was asking about Simon, and Simon is the Director of Guest Relations. So in this case, we have to be able to sort of guess that Guest Relations here is referring to Guest Relations here. So in this case, as we come back to the answer, this is one of those inference questions where we have to do a little more thinking. So where does he most likely work? Well, definitely not in Brighton. Possibly in London. But since we identify that guest relations is actually in Manchester, this is probably going to be the answer. And again, remember, 185 was the question that came last, and most likely it's going to be about one of the last pieces of information you're going to read. So some final thoughts. First off, think about the length of the passage to determine what you have to do. Now, if the passage is longer, then oftentimes we may have to do more reading. But as I tell students, do only what's necessary. Again, sometimes students want to read a passage and read a passage several times, and that really is not a good use of time. If the passage itself only requires a couple of questions, then really think about if the questions will tell us what to look for, then we probably need to read only what's necessary. 
So for the shorter single passages, I think it's probably a good idea that you can use the questions first to scan for the information. Now if you want to skim through the text too, that's okay. But part of the idea is how can we be more efficient on the test. So in this case, if you wanted to go to the questions first, it probably would be okay. However, if the passages are getting longer, and especially those double passages, we've got to do a lot more work. We've got to think about the format of the reading. We will need to skim the entire passage to see what the basic idea of the readings uh, happen to be. Now we can use the questions to determine how much to read. Uh, for example, with that vocabulary question, we didn't have to read the entire passage, only the information around it. But for the purpose questions, we probably had to read at least a few sentences and possibly even scan the whole text. Of course, for double passages, we have to do even more. We have to think about the connection between the two ideas and then probably skim both of them to think about and try to better understand what the relationship could be. Some final thoughts in terms of the questions themselves. Remember they're going to be in sequence. So the first question is usually answered closer to the beginning. The second question is usually somewhere after that and so on. And remember there are some tricks on the test. The TOEIC does love to restate information. So be careful with choosing answers that might have some of the same words. With the vocabulary questions, remember that the TOEIC may not necessarily be testing you on the first definition. It may be testing you on the second or third definition of a word. And oftentimes we do need to think about the context and how that will help us solve the problem. Once again, just want to remind you that there are some great materials out there to help you prepare for the test. The official TOEIC website, the Tactics for TOEIC textbook series by Grant True, and our new TOEFL and TOEIC preparation website. And uh, that's also where you can find a link to these videos and future videos that will be uh, forthcoming.